communicating with the office? Mm -hmm. What's the what's the, the you know what are you using as your as your you know is it a, is it a sketch? Is it a, is it a screen? Is it a how, how are you discussing the process of design? Well, I think unlike you know even most of the people in my generation all you know sketch and model all that on a computer just like the Google work for me. So. As a matter of fact, I was the person that taught those people that worked for me how to use those tools. So, um, you know, then especially, you know, now, you know, I'll find myself not knowing a lot of modeling things that, you know, somebody might bring in from different software or something. But back then, and more than now, like I was kind of the resident expert in terms of modeling of software. You know, somebody's computer couldn't get on the internet. Person that would fix it, and so I was that person. It wasn't like I had to communicate with that person, or so um, it was more like the story I was thinking about with David and um, Jefferson was you know, I said, Look, here are a family of curves where you know, if we have 12 of these curves, they're all sympathetic, so. Uh, I was playing around with, you know, could you make a curve that had three inflections? Or could you only have curves that have two inflections? Would it be too boring if you had curves with one inflection? And so we were at first testing the surface qualities, let's say, of the volumes and trying to figure out um, if they were 60 feet in diameter, more or less, with a uh, height and girth of you know, roughly 40 feet. Um, how much action could each one of these surfaces take and be constructible, look right, and all that. And I think the first couple of, couple of months was playing around with just the volumetrics of them and how they would meet the ground, how we would think about, you know, what they look like on the ground plane and how you enter them and things like that. Um, and so I would say, you know, let's try one where we loft across nine splines versus 12 splines. Let's try one that have, you know, three inflections into one, or let's try one that's all one inflection. And basically it was trial and error and, you know, trying to produce enough wrong things and enough right things that we would have a sense of which way to go. It was about the massing. So, first little bit, that's what it was. And once we started to hone in on those things, then we would also start building models. Like, okay, let's look at it now physically and see if this makes sense. Let's break it down into panels and see if it makes sense, and stuff like that. Um, at a certain point, that took a track where then it needed to move into, could we, automate the design of these things so that we could get, I forget what the number was, but let's say I said 50,000. Like, now we've got to model 50,000. So how will, you know, four or five of us model 50,000 of these? And I just, you know, did the math and said, well, if each one takes 10 minutes, this ain't going to ever happen because we've only got a few months. So that was when you know, Dave Erdman said, I think I can, you know, I think I can grind through these things and do 10,000 of them. And this guy Jefferson Ellinger said, well, I think I can write a script that will take Microsoft Excel files where we can swap these curves around in different combinations and create a database and use Microsoft Excel to drive what was then uh, alias. So you could have the curves in alias and you could set their rotation and position based on a Microsoft Excel file and you could surface them using a Microsoft Excel file. And at that point alias had these script editing features where you could basically plug, if you could get a stream of data in the right form, you could run a script editor that would automate all these steps. So. That was the first time we ever did something parametrically. And I remember giving each of them, it was like a Tuesday, that we had this discussion. 
And I said, okay, well, by Friday, let's see who's got the most done. Because we only have a few weeks. So, And what was funny is, you know, David sat there clicking, 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 like eight hours a day. And Jefferson just was working, writing a piece of software. But Friday morning, Jefferson software got done, and then we could just really automate. You know, then you could really do 50,000 of them because it was once you wrote the software. But that principle, you know, it's always something I think about. Like, there's a time for parametrics and there's a time for design. And given the task, one will make more sense than the other. So, at a certain point, you do shift into parametrics either because you know what you want or the task is so vast, there's no way to really. Um, <coughs> but but it was a kind of interesting little case study. What was the role in the software in the creative process? How did that both sort of as software developed and and what was the kind of back and forth? Well, like I said, the the character of the curves. I would later find out was. Um, there was a mathematics to it, um, but back then I thought it was a software, specific to the software. Like, um, you know, even then, and, and still in a funny way now, microstation splines um, are cleaner and look better than a lot of other spline modeling software because they wrote the mathematics for the code for splines sell it to Alias and they sell it to, you know, Rhino or whatever. It's all, but the root of it and the translation, the IGES format, it's a microstation thing. And so at that point, it was real important that we model all the curves in microstation. Um, lofting through the curves, it didn't really seem to make a difference what software we were using. It was all okay, I mean, whether it was microstation or Alias or Maya. Um, I know we never looked at soft homage at that point. Um, but but I would say the software, the kind of hand, what you would call the hand of the designer, was very software specific back then. So that was important. The <clears throat> you know, the rigor of it where like I said there were these plain planar curves that everything was lofted from. In if you lofted and subdivided into panels, the nature of the lofting was different. Where in some packages it would have what's called curve loop cutting, which later became really important. Um, where if the surface uh, folded through itself, it would automatically cut away the folds where it passed through itself, inside or outside. Um, and as we started to add material thickness, and as we started to put these things in the landscape and offset the landscape, we found these bleb, what they could call them webs, but these curve loops, um, which, you know, at first were a real annoyance. Where you kept saying, why are our splines so trashy? And why, once we do this thing once, does it become useless to use over and over again? But it, it then later on and subsequent things became really like one of the most important geometric things we ever found out about. Um, <clears throat> but curiously, microstation doesn't have curve loop cutting. And so we take things out of, we get a problem in, in alias. And I would say, you know, it's screwing up all these surfaces again. Well, often in microstation, it was fine. But when we would look really close, we would see these little, little loops, little pockets. And when we put the thing in the landscape, that's where we really saw it. And so, I don't know if you know, like the, if, if we put a house like that, the shape like that, and we, the way we set it in the landscape is I would offset these controlling curves at really big distances. And what it does is it looks at the normal of the curve, which is the perpendicular of a fictional point along the path. And if you say offset at 20 feet, what it'll do is it'll go 20 feet, 20 feet, 20 feet. 
that here it'll go 20 feet in, and there it'll go 20 feet out, 20 feet out. And so if you connect these curves, what you get is the curve will go through itself like that. And the software will automatically clip it right there. But when it clips it, you're losing this uh, normal, and you're losing all the CVs in that range. So if you try to do anything with this again, like make a service out of it, it turns into total garbage. And then if you go in with it, you get a different shape. You get a shape that goes like that. It's real systematic. And both this shape and this shape turns out they're mathematical curves. This is called Freeth's nephroid. And this is called, uh, they're both nephroid curves. And this is called, I forget. I would have to look it up. But they're actually, they're mathematical entities that happen when you offset along these curved spines. But anyway, it, when we were doing embryological house, you know, it was a revelation when I found out you could turn off this automatic feature. Um, later what it became is it's a great way to put volumes inside a surface. You know, you get a surface that makes its own volume in itself, which is real interesting. And that's the whole mathematical principle that sinks. It you find enclosed mathematical regions in something which is otherwise continuous. So is that an example of one of those accidents you've talked about that, that occurred during the design process? Yeah, this was a happy accident. I mean, in a sense, we didn't know, I didn't know, that when you offset a spline curve on itself that it would make these curve loops. And then once we found out that it did, it turned into a technique. You know, so the, like the IV Museum was the first time we ever used these webs, these curve loops architecturally, where there the idea was that there was a vertical structure that had these cantilever volumes off of them, which were these folds. But the same, those, the Slavin House Trust, that's all webs, the St. Colin, uh, Kunst Museum, competitions, all those webs. I mean, now we use that technique all the time in different ways. Embryological House was the first project where animation techniques were used without some pseudo-scientific alibi. I mean, basically the animation tools were used um, to blend from form to form to form to form to form. And the blending with animation was used to give us the endless numbers of variants. Um, and in all the cases where we used animation in it, it was real generative and a kind of uh, make a generic thing and then uh, give it more information to make it mutate. But it, it was the first time I used animation tools without uh, using some statistic or something from external to drive them. And it was also the first time, well, I mean, the Cardiff Bay Opera House used a found figure and duplicated it, but the embryological house, it was a real conscious thing for me to use a sphere. It wasn't really a sphere because it was a topological sphere, but I knew the minute all of my colleagues saw it, they would be deeply offended by its symmetry and purity and all that. And I knew, I also, it was around the any conferences with REM, I think it was right after the any conference in Seoul. Again, you know, my memory could be mixing these up, but I know in Seoul, Rem gave a talk on a generic. And to him, the generic was the banal and the everyday. And it was around the time of, you know, the people that were new urbanists, but in the academy where you couldn't really be a new urbanist, they all took the status of the everyday. Like Steve Harris and Edward Burke, and all these people were saying every day, and they use this term generic. And I had been reading for a long time uh, late 19th century biological literature, and that's where the term generic and genetic comes from. And the generic is a thing that's got all the potential that hasn't been specified, and the genetic is the specifications. And so I kept saying at these conferences, you're not talking about the generic. The generic thing is like an egg. It's a thing that hasn't unfolded yet. Um, 
but it's the yet to be unfolded thing. And so with Embryological House, I was really conscious to say, let's just start with a sphere, like kind of lay like pure thing. Um, even though there was never one that was a sphere, because they were all made from these spine curves. But if you took one curve and just duplicated it 12 times, you would get a thing which was pretty pure. So it, it was the first project that didn't go outside to define itself using animation, and also that was like a real strong primitive. <coughs> Although we did, I do remember all the curves. If you look at them in cross section, you know, this one was like 0.8 or whatever it was. These were like 1x, let's say. And this one was like 0.4x. So that when you lofted through them, you would get a thing that was wider than it was tall, and that its midsection was short. And that was because we knew that this thing was going to sit on the ground like this and then have these burns up to the side of it. So even though this curve could be identical 12 times around, each time we lofted it, there was a factor on it to give us the right proportion. So they were all like a little bit, you know, squished at their midsection and broader in the middle. But they were still pretty much like a sphere. If you open up in the animation editor, the blend shape tool, that's what we were using all the time. And I'm going to save over this file so you can see exactly what's going on with it. But you can see there are a series of seven primitives, which are targets. And this is the absolute simplest primitive, which is nearly a sphere. targets are, if I turn it to 100% of any one of the targets, you can see that's one of the target shapes. Mm -hmm. And each one of these is built, uh, each one of these is lofted out of a series of these planar curves, of which there are 12. So, you know, this might have maximum number of different curves that are making it up. I mean, this is a pretty exotic one. So that's one target. That's the second target, which is just as simple as possible sphere. So the way we do this, These happen to be the six that we selected as the extremes mm -hmm. to build. Mm -hmm. um, but now in between any one of those six target shapes, I can start to mix you know, different combinations. Uh -huh. Now like I said, as long as these don't ever go past one, right. I, you know, I guarantee they'll all be great. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, that's, that's the best one. That's, you know, that I guarantee they're all going to be beautiful. And why, you know. And yet, between those six variations, there, I have the, I don't know, the math to, to endless. How many, yeah. No, no, it's endless. I mean, you can, you can break them down incrementally as far as you want to go. Yes. Um, 
you know, you do get these kinds of yeah, anomalies, which we would go back in and fix. So once I do that, now it's going to go through and interpolate, you know, every single one of those. So it's morphing between each of the settings. Yeah, each of those settings is a variable, and it's calculating in between each one of those things. Uh, actually, if I pick. every one of these things is a target for the influence of each one of these things and it's just drawing this blind curve through each one. Um, you, know, you can see that's the frame we're on right there. So. Those were the beginnings of the basic curves. This was just as a kind of flows figure. These were the very first curves that we set. <coughs> you can see how in the primitive one, there are these 12 mm -hmm. points. And this is a diagram. But so, you know, in each one of these cases, you know, we take the whole thing it, we taper it, we pull one side of it to make it more convex, and we take a point and make it concave. And we take each one of those and we add a concavity at this corner. We go down one, and here we actually explode the number of points. So where there were 12 points, here we add one. So in between each one of those points we add two, and so then we add a foam on each one of those. this and those two to get that. So this was the initial kind of grid for those curves. Then we divided it into poles. Then we would take you know, these, those, 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 and assign each one of these a name. And then we could take this and we could make the next one in the rotation that, and we could make the next one in the rotation that, the next one in the rotation that. And on and on, and we started to play with what kind of surfaces we were going to get. And finally, we systematized uh, how to keep exploding points. So there you get 12 points. And each one of those 12 controls mm -hmm. another 8 on either side, and each one of those controls another 32 mm -hmm. between that. So you could explode them as you would go to get this kind of detail to the surface. Uh -huh. Which is just how we want.